ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನತಿಮರನ್ನಸಾಜ್ಞಾನಂಜನ ಶಲಾಖಾಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರುನ್ಮಿಧೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮ um but the fact is that uh it's a it'll be a discussion forum today is what you usually have right talking about shravan so I'll be calling for reflections and questions to expand the conversation and often times we um during the conversation or at least I should say I like to reference other uh scriptures that come up so if someone who's expert at uh searching the veda base can be ready to um find uh, using keywords and or looking up various verses the, the some of the verses we mentioned so that we can move into those verses and look at them and if also somebody has a dictionary handy on their device the more um expanded the dictionary the better we like to look at the etymology of words and things like that if possible while we're having the discussion how is everybody okay all right thanks for coming hi krishna we'll start with the song by bhakti vinod thakur which is a window to the spiritual world a description of krishna in his various relationships with his devotees and this song jai radha madhava is uh, a perennial favorite of course interestingly every song bhakti vinod thakur ever wrote was was a major hit <laughs> it's never been done before but everything he wrote um is uh emotes of spiritual emotion and poetically uh, perfect and uh, perfect according to rasa and so when uh, we get the songs from the great acharyas we're getting uh, sh- the shastric conclusions which are digested through the mind and heart of a pure devotee and then when we're able to take that practically as as if we're we're drinking bhava this men- is mentioned in the very beginning of the shrimad bhagavatam uh when it describes uh, what's to come in the shrimad bhagavatam and the verse nigama kalpatar galitam palam shukamukara mrita drava samyutam pibata bhagavatam this uh, pibata means uh, prepare to drink what is it you're going to drink you're going to drink nectar that's already been uh, predigested and is the fruit of the tree but it's not just the fruit of the tree but it's also druta which means it's kind of like been blended for you almost like a smoothie you can put the best ingredients in a smoothie and then there's not that much problem you just drink it and it's so intoxicating uh, says the author that that when you drink it, it really you should pass out <laughs> and then um not a concept uh, unknown to people i've seen here in new york <laughs> only i think that they're really suffering because we saw somebody yesterday bent over a um a railing and we really felt sorry for him we weren't sure what to do exactly um there wasn't anything immediate that we we could do cuz the person was really in a stupor govinda had recommended or had asked about giving him a lollipop but he didn't look really in the shape for that <clears throat> but this uh beverage which one takes and passes out from then one can uh be restored and drink it again and again and again it's kind of what everyone's looking for the kind of uh intoxication that uh in is edifying and actually uh is intoxicating without any of the side effects i think he we lewis sang about that in the 1980s with his hit song i i want a new drug i wrote about that once because it it is something people consider when drug companies advertise a new drug usually 90% of the advertisement is a disclaimer required by the FDA which telling all the side effects that it's going to have and they go on for about a half an hour trying to mask it by <laughs> making it seem like it's no big deal you'll get dry mouth you probably get a stomach ache you probably you could die and so <laughs> forth but with with the bhagavatam the all the in, 
all the benefits are there and even the intoxicating effect is there but there's no uh, mal effect from taking uh, the, the Bhagavatam. So nigama kalpa gorot palitam palam and nigama means the, the Vedas. Nigama actually means to go within. Gama means to go and ni means within. So finding out what's inside nigama kalpa toror galitam palam there are tree are the Vedas but if you go to the Vedas, as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Dure Harikatamritam, the, the Upanishads, they're very far from the nectar of the Vedas, although they're part of the same tree. And the Upanishads are actually the first transcendental part of the Vedas. If you go to the tree, yes, you might say, as it's a mango tree, and you go to the, the bark, you may say, well, there's some mango in the bark somewhere. But what we're really looking for is the fruit. So the, the Srimad Bhagavatam is that fruit and it's also been tasted by Shukadeva Goswami and that means when the parrot bites the, the fruit, then the fruit becomes sweeter. So it's, it's everything that the, everyone's always been looking for and they weren't sure was available or they're looking in the wrong places. So let's sing this song first and then we'll go into the Bhagavatam. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jayam Udiraye So I'm continuing the reading in the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam because I heard that it, it's a, I can pick up wherever I like. Is that true? As far as I'm concerned, it is. I'm, <laughs> I'm in, taking my um, course in the Bhaktivedanta. Uh, exams. There's Bhakti Shastri, then Bhakti Vaibhav, and Bhakti Vedanta. So I'm preparing for my quiz when I go home. So don't mind if I do double duty, because it's in the seventh canto that we're being quizzed. So um, perhaps you can quiz me while we're going through this and so help me get ready. But I just happened to be in this uh, section that uh, will be very relevant to all of you because the title of the chapter is Instructions for Civilized Human Beings. <laughs> and there, is, there isn't anything more civilized than sitting down for a Srimad Bhagavatam class, especially in a holy place. And on the way from the, the airport the other day, I believe it was Thursday, we were reading from the Bhagavatam, and I was struck by some of the ways in which Srila Prabhupada describes how um, yagya or sacrifice becomes particularly effective and he was saying that if you perform religious activities in a holy place it is uh, more effectacious and then he said that it's very difficult to get to many holy places these days but iskon temples particularly because radha krishna or gornitai are installed there and there are vaishnavas there and there's prasadam and the holy name that these places are ideal for performing religious sacrifice. And then he went on to say that if one goes to these places and performs sacrifice, then one gets a thousand times the benefit. And I was thinking about how one who's thought about how important the human life is and has been able to discern from the Shastras that the purpose of human life is for advancing spiritually and that there is there's a particular means to do this and then enthusiastically takes up those means and also finds out how to position oneself in the best way to take advantage of them really can advance very quickly therefore I, uh, th this would be the very definition of a civilized person somebody who knows how to avail him or herself of, of such opportunities. Furthermore, the other day um, 
I happened upon a, uh, a, a YouTube presentation by someone who was uh, extolling the virtues of being civil. And she was doing so in the context of economic development and pointing out to various uh, apparently, you know, uh, company owners and such who might have been listening to this. In fact, I think it was a TED talk that um, c civility is, um, well, let me put it the other way. She was saying incivility is costly. It costs companies a lot of money. <laughs> and she was giving solid evidence for the fact that when people learn to be civil, they, they're actually more in harmony in their lives and in their work. And when they're uh, uncivil, then there, there's a great human cost and also a business cost and so forth. So it pays to be civil. It, and when one's a human being, actually from one vantage point, it's expected that one would develop civility. The best of all civility, of course, is, is attained uh, systemically by hearing and chanting the names of the Lord because there's a way in which Krishna has all good qualities. He's the, the reservoir of all good qualities. And in our philosophy, we, all of us, as uh, uh, small parts of Krishna, take on the qualities of others by our Sangha. And Krishna mentions this in the Bhagavad Gita in the 13th chapter, 22nd verse, where he says, Purusha prakriti stohi bhunte prakriti jan gunan karanam guna sangosya sarasad yoni janmasu. He said, take a look at your life and see what good or bad you have now. And he says, you can be sure that you have, you're in these situations to whatever degree you are because of your past association. This is a real clue to how to position oneself in such a way that one can uh, benefit one's own self. And that is being in good association and uh, developing oneself by that association. And it's also um, mentioned throughout the Shastra that the way in which we associate most intimately with others, either in person or from afar, by hearing what they have to say. And everybody has something to say. And it's, it is representative or um, it, it is, um, one can understand what the consciousness of another person is by hearing what they have to say, if you listen carefully. And therefore, the Shastras say that uh, one should associate with those who are lovers of Krishna or who are vitally interested in the, uh, going back home, back to God. They're called satam, or persons who are sincere about the process of spiritual life. This is mentioned in the third canto, 25th chapter, 25th verse, by Sri Kapiladev, the incarnation of God, whose mother is Devahuti. And he's, he, he says, Asatam prasangam mamavirya sambhido bhavantirit karna rasayana kata tash joshana ashua pavarga vartmini shadaratir bhaktir anukrama shriti. This is a, a very uh, encouraging verse, and especially the last word of the verse, anukramishriti, which means that uh, one step follows another if you do what the verse says at the beginning. I love those kind of process uh, instructions where it's like, if you just do this, then this will happen. It's like, oh, what do I do now? So the beginning of the verse says, satam prasangam avavirya sambhido. So this means that if you associate with those who are satam, and that means that they're sincere and engage in the process of hearing about Krishna or executing the, the tenets of Shastra and endeavoring to go back to Godhead with great vigor. Then what will happen is you'll hear a sound vibration that comes from these people that will enter your ear and from your ear it goes to your heart and the heart is the, the seat of the soul and of our consciousness and is considered to be the dr our driver. For instance, if the body is a chariot, then the driver is the heart. And 
it will reverse our direction in life from pavarga, which means being involved in the temporary world, which obligates me to transmigrate from one body to the next. And I won't go into all the details because it's a little depressing. Yeah. But, but it reverses the process. And then it's called apavarga. And that means that one's on an upward trajectory towards the ultimate goal of life and going back to Krishna. And this happens by remaining in the association of satam and hearing from them. And then step by step, one makes advancement in devotional service. And the verse also mentioned that it happens relatively quickly in that kind of association and by hearing in that association. And so today's verse is from Canto 7, chapter 15, the instructions for civilized human beings, and this is text number 41. The, the translation is, transcendentalists who are advanced in knowledge compare the body which is made by the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead to a chariot. The senses are like the horses the mind, the master of the senses, is like the reins. The objects of the senses are the destinations. Intelligence is the chariot driver. And the consciousness which spreads throughout the body is the cause of bondage in this material world. You like it? Yes. Keep going? Yes. Okay. Purport. For a bewildered person in the materialistic way of life, the body, the mind, and the senses which are engaged in sense gratification are the cause of bondage to repeated birth, death, old age, and disease. But for one who is advanced in spiritual knowledge, the same body, senses, and mind are the cause of liberation. This is confirmed in the Kata Upanishad as follows, Atmanam ratinam vidhi, shariram ratami vacha, buddhim tu saratim vidhi, mana ragraham evacha, indriyani hayan ahur, vishayam teshu gocharan, sodvana param atnoti, tadvishnu paramam param. The soul is the occupant of the chariot of the body, of which the driver is the intelligence. The mind is the determination to reach the destination. The senses are the horses, and the sense objects are also included in that activity. Thus, one can reach the destination Vishnu, who is Paramam Padam, the supreme goal of life. In conditioned life, the consciousness in the body is the cause of bondage. But the same consciousness, when transformed into Krishna consciousness, becomes the cause for one's returning home back to Godhead. The human body, therefore, may be used in two ways, for going to the darkest regions of ignorance or for going forward, back home, back to Godhead. To go back to Godhead, the path is Mahat Seva, to accept self-realized spiritual master. Mahat Sevam, Dwara Mahurva Mukte. For liberation, one should accept the direction of authorized devotees who can actually endow one with perfect knowledge. On the other hand, Tamo Dwaram Yoshitam Sangi Sangam. If one wants to go to the darkest regions of material existence, one may continue to associate with persons who are attached to women, yoshitam sangi sangam. The word yoshit means woman, persons who are too materialistic or attached to women. And that includes the vice versa, as mentioned in the Bhagavatam elsewhere, that the impetus for mistaking the body to be the self, the external form that I've taken on now, I may invest myself in and advertise myself as being a, a particular kind of body. And 
then there's a natural way, because of the, the, the laws of material nature, that I become inextricably attached to certain kinds of objects in the world. And when this description of Yoshitam is mentioned, is very particularly, or I should say generally, referring to this uh, attraction and counter-attraction that happens on the bodily conception of life and mistakenly thinking that I am my body and my interaction with, the modes, with, with other bodies that I am attracted to will become the source of happiness. Whereas in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna uh, helps to divest us of that misconception. He says, Yehi samsparsha bhoga dukha yonaya evate adhyantavantakontaya na teshu ramate bhuta that a person who is intelligent understands that the cause of misery is my full attention to the sense objects and thinking that I'll find some kind of satisfaction through giving my energy to titillating the senses or, or um, interacting with the sense objects wholeheartedly. But he says actually the opposite is true. From that, I get a kind of frustration called uh, dukkha. In fact, he says that the, the poetically here, the womb of, uh, from the womb of this interaction comes a little child named Dukey, <laughs> who uh, is his main job in life is to torment. Uh, so uh, that's what happens, and that's what's being referred to here in this famous verse, Mahat Sevam Dwara Mahurva Muktes Tamo Dwaram Yoshitam Sangi Sangam. When we talk about the interaction, when it's speaking about uh, Yoshitam Sangi Sangam, uh, specifically says here in the in Prophet's commentary about uh, attraction for women, it means this superficiality of attraction, men for women, when, uh, women for men, and in, in this a misconception that I am the physical body. And before I go to the next paragraph, let's just see, first of all, what you heard so far. Like if any particular element of, of what we read so far in the verse of the purport stuck in your mind, if you can just recount it back. It just helps to expand the, her vision of the, what we're hearing. Yes. Should say the scope of what we're hearing, not the vision. Interesting. <laughs> Try again. It needs to go up. It has been in disrepair. It may still be broken. Is there another one? No. There's one order, so I yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, go ahead and I'll repeat what you say because people online need to hear. So one of the things, the first things that caught my attention. One of the first things that caught her attention. It's in the verse itself. In the it verse says itself. That the sense objects become our destination. In the verse it says the sense objects become our destination. And we all think we're going somewhere. We all think we're going somewhere. But whatever it is that we're desirous of is actually the place that we're going whatever, to. Whatever we're desirous of, that's the place we're going to. And I think that we're, we're quite mistaken when we think we're going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we're quite mistaken if we think we're going somewhere when we're no. pursuing the objects of the senses. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. That, that was a, a really good uh, observation. Astute, I should say. Um, a couple of comments. One is that you'll find in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam the appearance of the Hamsa avatar, who gives, makes a, a cameo in that, in that particular canto and speaks to uh, uh, Sanat Kumar and others. And he describes the way in which we become inextric inextricably connected to the material world. And that is because each one of our indriyas, or senses, has a subtle element behind it. And that subtle sense that we have has its counterpart in, in the uh, outer world. Of course, Krishna describes in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Indriyani Priyanyahur Indriyabhya Paramaraha Manasas Tu Parabhudhiryo Bhudhe Paratastu Saha Lowest of all are the senses, above the senses is the mind of the mind 
is the intelligence, and above the intelligence is the atma or the soul. Below the senses are the sense objects. What is the relationship between my senses and the sense objects? The relationship, says Hans Avatar, is that the, the mind, which is the, the center of all the senses, is embedded in the sense objects. And the sense objects are also embedded within the mind. This explains one of the phenomena that is interestingly explained by Kapila Dev in the Srimad Bhagavatam, and that is that a soul, when in the womb of his or her mother, will often come to a full consciousness and realize that I'm in a precarious situation. And that is that I, the soul realizes that I've been transmigrating uh, again and again into various wombs. And now I'm about to uh, come out again into the world. And that soul realizes that as soon as I do come out into the world, I'm going to forget again that I'm actually a soul. And although it's described as a, an extremely, um, not just inconvenient, but suffering situation to be trapped within the womb, and what to speak of, have the awareness that I'm going to be captured again by the material energy when I come out. That the, the, the soul prays, I'd rather stay here and be in full consciousness in the suffering condition than actually come out. So it's explained that when the, the soul then, um, the body of the soul becomes ready to come out and is pushed out through the birth channel, as soon as that baby comes out into the world, his or her senses become uh, attached to their objects because they're already connected, they're embedded there. And the, that living entity become, becomes uh, absorbed again. A, a bini beshita means fully absorbed in the sense objects because that's the natural uh, way of uh, coming out into the material world and being fully absorbed in, in the sense objects. So it's very difficult to extricate oneself. Therefore, there's an admonition that from the very beginning, there should be uh, some scars or practices through which that baby becomes um, purified. The senses become purified and, and that there can be some sadhana through which the child naturally starts to develop an awareness of the soul and the purpose of life. So that, um, and, and then become self-determining. Thank you for that reflection. What else did you hear? Yes. Well, it, just when you were saying it pays to be civil. It pays to be civil. And I was considering so many people are civil engineers. And so many people are civil engineers. <laughs> And, and so the Bhagavatam is the ultimate civil engineer. And the Bhagavatam is the ultimate civil engineer. And what our practice is, are in, in the truest sense, instead of, I, don't, I really don't know what real civil engineer, I mean. Yeah, what real do, civil engineer is. I don't know what that do, is. But, but, but what we really want to be is a civil engineer. That's a profound. You know, you've just solved the problem I have because whenever I fill out an immigration form going into a new country <laughs> and they say occupation, it's funny, I sit there sometimes for half an hour and go, what should I put? <laughs> and now I know what I'm going to say, civil engineer. <laughs> if anybody asks me, you say, I have the, my guidebook is right here, civil engineering. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point, I like that. Do you write comedy by any chance? I'm a clown. Oh, okay. <laughs> we should talk after Literally, this. Right? So. <laughs> Well done, well done. Okay, what else? What else did you hear? Yes. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, my Adrishe guru, Hirdayananda uh, Taskaswami, gave a Bhagavatam class, and he said that Bhakti Yoga is the process of becoming civilized. That with our sadhana and our associations, we uh, gradually learn to, uh, to become pure, uh, to not just purified, but to civilize our thoughts, civilize our words. She's saying that Hridayananda Maharaj was recently giving a lecture in which she 
in which he said that the process of bhakti yoga is the process of becoming civilized, and um, that. And, and that uh, that that our practice allows us to uh, adopt uh, allows us to adopt like a civility in our words, our actions, and our thoughts. And becoming civil is not thinking that you are the center. But becoming civil means uh, not that you think that you're the center. Right, but offering everything back. But offering everything back to Krishna. I just came from Japan and had to wait for translation. Now I feel like I'm doing something. <laughs> yeah. I want to read to you some of Krishna's opinions about what is a civilized person. So Krishna, this is in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And here Krishna describes the various qualities of civility in those uh, human beings that are devotees that he appreciates. So, starting up at text 13, 12, 13. 12, 13. Krishna says, one who is not envious, but is a kind friend to all living entities who does not think himself a proprietor and is free from false ego, who is equal in both happiness and distress, who is tolerant, always satisfied, self-controlled, and engaged in devotional service with determination, his mind and intelligence fixed on me. Such a devotee of mine is very dear to me. There's more. 15. He by whom no one is put into difficulty and who is not disturbed by anyone, who is equipoised in happiness and distress, fear and anxiety is very dear to me. My devotee who is not dependent on the ordinary course of activities, who is pure, expert, without cares, free from all pains, and not striving for some result, is very dear to me. One who neither rejoices nor grieves, who neither laments nor desires, and who renounces both auspicious and inauspicious things, such a devotee is very dear to me. One who is equal to friends and enemies, who is equipoised in honor and dishonor, heat and cold, happiness and distress, fame and infamy, who is always free from contaminating association, always silent and satisfied with anything, who doesn't care for any residence, who is fixed in knowledge, and who is engaged in devotional service, such a person is very dear to me. Those who follow this imperishable path of devotional service and who completely engage themselves with faith, making being the supreme goal, are very, very dear to me. So these are indicators of civility, according to Krishna. And actually hearing about them is enticing. There's a way in which by hearing about them, one may then consider aspiring for them and also note whether one's developing them or not. So it's helpful to take inventory and see, am I able to tolerate. That's something that comes up throughout the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, Krishna says that one who develops the, the power of tolerance is uh, able to be a happy person in this life and is also eligible for liberation. Shakno ti haivaya shodhum prakshirira vimokshana kama krodo bhavam negam sayukta sa sukhinara. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, fifth chapter that a person who has developed the shakti, the ability to uh, overcome anger, shaknoti haviyashurum prakshirira, before one gives up the body. <laughs> Don't wait till the end. Um, prakshirira vimokshana, kama, desire means uh, unnecessary, this is Prabhupada's phrase, unnecessary necessities. That's a Prabhupadaism. It's in his purports. Unnecessary necessities. Or as Krishna says 
in the second chapter of the Gita, don't be a kama kami. Yeah. You may notice that there are desires th that are floating through your mental system, but don't be one who is um, obligated to chase after them, a kama kami. But be, um, be discriminating. In fact, this is the sign of a person who's fixed in consciousness, says Krishna in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. When asked by Arjuna, what is the symptom of somebody who's actually civil, who's, which means fixed in spiritual consciousness? And I'll prove that in a minute if you like. But he says, does Krishna, prajahatiyada kama sarvan partan manogatan atman yeva anatushta stita pragnasta dochite. Stita pragnas dodochide uchite. It is said the person who is fixed in consciousness is one who is able to with, withhold or withdraw his or her senses from sense objects when necessary. The mind is said to be a factory that can constantly manufacture its desires and it's they're coming out as if on a conveyor belt, one after another. And the person of discrimination uh, is able to um, look and see, uh, these are not, uh, it's not necessary for me to, to, to uh, buy all these things. I don't have to purchase them. And uh, such a person also is described as deriving his or her pleasure from within. Atman yebatmana tushta, tushta say, tushta. It almost, it's almost, almost anamana piyak, that, that there's a way in which the, the word tushta means satisfaction, and that person finds satisfaction within, by seeing the self. So these are, uh, this tolerance is, is a sign of civility. It's also something that you can't fake. There are kinds of civility that you can fake, like, you can wear nice clothes mm -hmm. and perhaps live, live in a um, so-called nice neighborhood. But then what happens when you're tested? Are you able to tolerate? Whereas someone may um, live in a, in, a, um, in a rougher environment, but if you notice, or, or not even um, have expensive clothes, but if such a person is able to tolerate, that's noteworthy. Someone might say, oh, that's amazing that they have the power to do that. What to speak of the power to forgive, which is right up there with tolerance. It's a kind of uh, shakti, ability that one develops. And this is all derived, as we started at the beginning, by association with Krishna. As Krishna, as mentioned in the first canto of the Bhagavatam, is the reservoir of all these good qualities. And if someone takes the time to associate with Krishna, then by association one will also develop such good qualities. Therefore, as Vasudev Prabhu will confirm, it says in the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam, 5.12.18, uh, Yene, uh, no, that's not the verse, Yes, yes, Dibhaktir Bhagavatiya Kinshana Sarvar Gunas Tatra Samasate Sura Harava bhaktasya kuto mahat guna manorate nasati tavato bihi. There's a way in which the devotees develop all these good qualities uh, through association with Krishna. In fact, it's said that uh, those who associate with Krishna through the process of devotional service develop such nice qualities that the devas want to come and associate with them. On the other hand, if one doesn't take the time to cultivate such things through association with Krishna, through his holy name, and through the Srimad Bhagavatam, then no matter how one tries to embrace civility, and this is going much to what Maharaj said, that one may not be able to sustain it. Because when push comes to shove, and it will, uh, one's real nature will come out. I'm not grouchy. <laughs> like where'd that come from <laughs> so it, it's actually noticeable in oneself too the, the effects of associating with the holy name any other we'll take one last reflection and I should keep going in the, in the purport a little bit anything you heard so far 
Yes. And the first verse. Yay. Yeah. 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 It says, and consciousness which spreads throughout the body is the cause of bondage in the material world. And it just really, really struck me when we, when we read that, that the consciousness, when we hear consciousness, we think the soul. The soul is the reason for consciousness in the body. And it's the soul, this consciousness being in touch with matter and being absorbed in the senses, as you were talking about, which is the cause of bondage in the body. And if we can transfer that to withdrawing the consciousness from those sense objects and becoming Krishna conscious, then that's also the cause of freedom from the material bondage. Yes, this is an excellent point. And I'll just add a little um, kind of refinement to the end of it. And, and that is that it's not only um, that we, well, first of all, that it is a fact, according to the Bhagavatam, that I become absorbed in the, the sense objects because of a misconception. The misconception is that I'm part of this world. The Vedas say definitively, Asango Khyayam Purushaha, little jiva, guess what? You don't belong here. You're not part of this world at all. In fact, you have nothing to do with it. The energy you're cohorting with actually is uh, foreign to you. That's why we feel so frustrated here. And the Bhagavatam goes on to say, Bhayam dvitiya abhini beshata syad, ishad apeta syad vibharya yo smitihi. And that is that I become absorbed in matter because I've made a fundamental mistake. And that is thinking that I'm uh, independent from God and that I actually have my own separate existence in this material world. And there's a kind of um, uh, advertisement that I'm doing to promote my false existence. Or as Rita says, that the material body and everything that goes with it is a DBA. You know what that means? Doing business as. When you have a corporation, you can, you can run the corporation under different names. There's a process you have to go through. You have to publish it in the newspaper, at least it used to be like this, and, and say that we are such and such a corporation. We've decided to continue doing our work as a corporation, but we're going to do it under some other name also. And th then you have to wait some time, and there's this paperwork you fill out. And then, for instance, if you say, you know, our company is, the base company is called Acme, but we're going to uh, do business as the, um, you have a good name for it? That I am my body uh, corporation? And then you advertise for it. So. There's a way in which when I become absorbed in the bodily conception of life, I, have, I put out a DBA. I'm doing business as. I'm actually a soul, but now I'm doing business as somebody else. <laughs> and I take on a new name and a persona and so forth. And I become absorbed in that new identity. And I really, it takes a lot of work to promote also th that this is who I am because it's, I mean, it, it's foreign to my nature. That's why bhakti is so natural. So, I become absorbed in that. Um, withdrawing from the senses really is a matter of reattaching myself to better sense gratification. Because one could argue that the real condition of, of life is to be addicted. Souls are addicted to something or other. And you have your choice. You can be addicted to dead matter or you can be addicted to the spiritual world. And the interim is not sustainable. That is, you say, I'll have no addiction whatsoever, please. And you may stay there for some time, says the Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam says, if you come to a point where you're not addicted to Krishna, then whatever kind of uh, withholding you're doing or staying back from the senses of the variety of the material world, it, you won't be able to sustain it. You'll fall back into the addiction of the material world. So really it's a matter of, rather than withholding my senses from their objects, I'm trying to transfer my addiction. Uh, addiction transfer services. How can I direct your call? And, 
And this is, means, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Narupa Masye Hatatopa Labyate, 15th chapter, 4th uh, and 5th verse. Narupa Masye Hatatopa Labyate, Nanto Najadina Nachasam Pratishta, Ashvatamenam Suvaruda Mulam Sangha Shastrena Jardena Chitva, Tatat Padam Tat Parimargitavyam Yasmin Gatana Nirvatanti Buya. Tameva chadyam purusham prapadye yatak praviti prashita purani. Herein Krishna is saying that the material world is a very complicated place. We don't really even know where we are. You can't see its form, it's so big. It's like a banyan tree, a huge banyan tree, the universe. I'm in the middle of it, so from my perspective, I can't see where I am, I can't see the form of it, I can't see the beginning, I can't see the end. And if you think about it, we don't really know how we got here in the first place. We just showed up. And then there was a couple of people waiting for us with a name tag <laughs> and said, guess what? We got a college fund for you. And you're going to work hard. You got SATs to take. And, and all this uh, stuff comes just, all of a sudden you're just thrust into it. Where did it come from? Uh, previous momentum, karma, and then so Krishna says, you have to get to a position where you can uh, cut down this strongly rooted tree, like withdraw from, from the illusory existence of the material world. But then he says, immediately you have to go on a journey. It's, there's the journey that starts right after you cut down this tree, and he says, asanga shastrina, dridhena chitva. Cut down this illusory attachment to the material world through the weapon of detachment. Tatakpadam tat parimargitavyam. Parimargitavyam means then you have, to, you have to be going somewhere. You can't just cut it down. It's like, you know, union goes on strike. Union people can go on strike, and once they're on strike, that's not a stable situation. Like, what do you do for a living? I'm on strike. That's, that's an interim situation. You can't stay there. So you may decide that I don't like the material world, I don't like the terms, birth, death, old age, and disease, I quit. Sign the application for going on strike. But then, you gotta go somewhere, you gotta get a job. So, you either have a job in the material world, which is called karma, where you have to work really hard, and you don't get anything in return except for more debt. Does that sound good? And then, or, you can work for Krishna. Parimargitavya means start your journey, and find that person who's the original source of everything, who's your best friend, and then take shelter there. That's the process of bhakti. A lot of, um, there are a lot of ideas, fragmented ideas about self-realization that kind of leave you there after you cut down the tree. Now what do I do? And the Bhagavatam is saying over and over again that that's not sustainable. You actually have to have somewhere to go. You have to have a project to work on. And it's got to be really good. So that means bhakti. So now we'll continue the purport. It is said, therefore, Atmanam ratinam vidhi shariram ratami vacha. The body is just like a chariot or car in which one may go anywhere. One may drive well or else one may drive whimsically in which case it is quite possible that he may have an accident and fall into a ditch. <coughs> in other words, if one takes directions from the experienced spiritual master, one can go back home, back to Godhead. Otherwise, one may return to the cycle of birth and death. Therefore, Krishna personally advises, Asuradhana purusha tarmasya se parantapa prapyamam nivartante nityasaravartmani those who are not faithful in the path of devotional service cannot attain me, O conqueror of foes, but return to birth and death in this material world. Bhagavad Gita 9.3 The Supreme Personality of God and Krishna personally gives instruction on how one can return home back to Godhead. But if one does not care to listen to his instructions, the result will be that one will never go back to Godhead, but will continue life in this, in this miserable condition of repeated birth and death in material existence. Mṛtyu saṅsāra vārtmani. So first of all, the body is a chariot or a car, and that's um, 
something that is mostly understandable by people. Prabhupada points this out in uh, purport in the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, in which uh, Shukadeva Goswami is advising that one become introspective and observe one's own existence and one's own body and try to look within. Shri Shri Radha Murali Dara Ki Jai, Shri Gura Mahaprabhu Ki Jai, Shri Shri Lakshmi Nishangadeva Ki Jai, Gaur Premanande Hari Bhai. And he says that even a, a common, ordinary person can uh, make a discernment that he or she is different from the machine of the material body if you just take a little time to observe that your body is uh, a biomechanical, um, it's biomechanical, and that you're the one observing it, therefore you're not it. And you can go through the, definitely through the physical body and observe that. Like, what is this right now? What kind of instrument am I uh, exhibiting through doing this motion? The biceps is pulling the arm up and down. If you were like an engineer, what would you say I'm using? It's a lever. A, a lever, yeah. There's a lever and a pulley. You know, through the tricep and bicep, definitely lever, pulley. And how about if you feel your heart for a second? Go ahead, if you dare. <laughs> it's still beating. What is it? It's a pump. Decidedly a pump. And you can go through all the different various uh, features of your gross physical body and notice that it's, it's mechanical. And then you can also observe a common ordinary person, although people don't get much time to do this nowadays, but if you take a closer look at the inner workings of your mind and intellect, you can see uh, and observe how it's going through um, various functions and you can notice that you're the observer and you can also says Prabhupada in his purport notice that your intelligence is coming to you much like a parent might uh, instruct uh, a helpless child and give helpful instructions say move this way don't move that way or give answers to questions have you ever noticed that that your intellect is benevolent in that way and providing you with instruction? Please say yes. yes. Thank you. So, uh, in this way, he takes, he takes us through, does Srila Prabhupada, a process that he says anyone can do to uh, make a self-examination of, of the gross physical body and what's called the psychological body, the mind and intelligence and ego, and one can notice that one's separate from those things. And so oftentimes, like yesterday when we were out on book distribution, I was telling uh, quite a few people when I show them a Bhagavad Gita that this book points out that we're not our body. And nobody really objected. And I, I would say the body's more like a car, like a vehicle we're driving around in. And that's then altogether unreasonable. Most people will pretty much agree with that. Although the other day when we were in Japan and I was talking about not our body and then we had a sharing section, everyone around, there were two women there that said they liked everything but they were having a hard time with un appreciating that we're, we're not our bodies. <laughs> but they were, they were going to think it over, which is a good idea. But I just thought, <laughs> it's, it's an, it is something that's, that's not out of reach, even for... Uh, the proverbial man on the street. It's, it's not out of reach. But the only thing is I don't take time to actually introspect. It's possible to go one full day without introspecting, isn't it? And if it's possible to go one day, it's possible to go to a week, right? If it's possible to go to a week, it's possible to go one full month with projects in front of one's face and, and anxieties to get the next thing done, right? How about a year? How about 10 years? How about a whole lifetime? Yes. As a philosopher said, an unexamined life isn't worth living. And you know what's to examine? Examine your own life. There's a life inside you that's actually fascinating. But I don't get time to look at it. But to speak of consider it that I'm driving the car and how is it that I'm driving, who's helping me and so forth. These are actually fascinating uh, considerations. And when we were walking by NYU yesterday down the street because we had a book table nearby there, 
I was looking up and down at all the departments and thinking, you know, how much is it going to cost me to go to school here? <laughs> and, and then I was thinking, is there any department that actually penetrates into this topic? And it, it, I really couldn't see any. I mean, I didn't see the psychology department, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe there is a department now that it goes more into the metaphysical idea that you're not your body. But this is something Prabhupada brought up at MIT when he was there. And the students were, were rather uh, stunned by his statement and appreciative as well. And that was, where is there a department to dis discover the difference between a dead body and a living body? Mm. Well, there wasn't one. So anyway. <laughs> so then Prabhupada points out here that um, don't move whimsically in the world. And he, he mentions taking expert direction from a spiritual master. So I always find that the example Prabhupada gives of taking expert guidance from a spiritual master to be especially understandable in the terms of uh, legal matters. And if you get in, legal, uh, in need of legal help, then it's, um, it's uh, foolhardy to just go it alone. Because the law not only is um, complicated, and it, it's, it's forever changing, you have to know um, what's really going on so you don't get implicated further. So Prabhupada says uh, a good uh, spiritual master is like a, a good lawyer. The lawyer knows the books and knows the law. Of course, I saw a, a t-shirt that said, a good lawyer knows the law, and a great lawyer knows the judge. Yeah. <laughs> so that's true of a, a guru also. So, so once you, in any matter, actually, uh, you know, when it comes to being progressive in life, one should have a coach. And you should, you know, someone who knows how to direct a person, knows how to ask the right questions so that you can come to the right conclusions and form the... The, the right goals in life and so forth. And um, this is there at the highest levels, for instance, in athletics, even the, the most accomplished athletes, you'll notice they had a coach. Uh, they have coaches. I remember, what was his name? Andrew Ag A Agassi. What was his Andre first name? Agassi. Andre Agassi. I remember watching him years ago. And I was, his coach was Brad Gilbert, who wasn't Technically, like, you know, if they played tennis against each other, Andre Agassi would beat him every time. But then he was taking help from Brad Gilbert, and I was thinking, that's really interesting how somebody that... But so the, the, the relationship is there with those who want to perform at a high level. And in spiritual life also, in order to refine one's practice, it's very necessary to have guidance. In fact, Devamrita Swami likes to say that Vaishnavism is a culture of guidance of availing oneself to, to the proper guidance so that you don't go whimsically. And this is something that Prabhupada mentions in the Bhagavad Gita in the matter of the austerities of speech, that a person who's acquainted with spiritual culture and good guidance doesn't speak whimsically also. Whenever he or she speaks, uh, that person will back it up with, uh, with evidence from the Shastra. Otherwise, uh, it's discordant when someone comes into an assembly of Vaishnavas and then makes a statement and someone says, well, where's that from? And they say, well, I don't know. It just sounds like a good idea. Or I, th I think this is true. It doesn't uh, fit into the context very well. So this is the culture, to, to be very careful about the way one moves in life and consider it to be like legal implication. You need um, to be able to have expert guidance to get out. And then... Um, yeah, I'll continue. The advice of experienced transcendentalists, therefore, is that the body be fully engaged for achieving the ultimate goal of life, Swartagatim. The real interest or goal of life is to return home back to Godhead. To enable one to fulfill this purpose, there are so many Vedic literatures, including Vedanta Sutra, the Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, and Ramayana. One should take lessons from these Vedic literatures and learn how to practice nivritti marg. Then one's life will be perfect. 
the body is important as long as, that, as it has consciousness. Without consciousness, the body is merely a lump of matter. Therefore, to return home back to Godhead, one must change his consciousness from material consciousness to Krishna consciousness. One's consciousness is the cause of material bondage, but if this consciousness is purified by bhakti yoga, one can then understand the falsity of his upadi, his designations as Indian, American, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, and so on. Sarvopadi vanir muktam tatratvena nirmalam. One must forget these designations and use this consciousness only for the service of Krishna. Therefore, if one takes advantage of the Krishna consciousness movement, his life is certainly successful. So now, let's stand up for one minute, please. And you could um, interlock your fingers like this, and then put your hands overhead like this, and then reach up as far as you can, and stretch a little higher, and put your chin down, and then bring your hands down again, and switch your index fingers, the interlocking section, and then again, stretch up and as high as you can and try to stretch your rib cage towards the ceiling and take a deep breath and let in some oxygen and let the blood flow and then come back down and we can sit down again <laughs> <laughs> um, yes when you interlace your fingers and you lift uh, yes. your palms up to the sky that's referred to as buddhiyangasana Buddhiyangasana, you just did. Arms. Intelligence arms. <laughs> That's probably why someone told me I should do it a lot. <laughs> and now, uh, please turn to somebody that's near you and tell them uh, one thing that you've taken away from, from the discussion so far. The one thing that's most uh, prominent in your mind, perhaps that you could take away in your pocket that you might use later on, but tell it, tell it to a friend next to you. And then we'll take a few samples of uh, what, what the person told you. Are you, are you ready? Yeah. Okay, go ahead and share. <laughs> now, if you can hear me, raise your hand. Wow. <laughs> okay. So hold that thought. I'm going to make a couple comments about the first sentence in the last paragraph. It says, Prabhupada writes, the advice of experienced transcendentalists, therefore, is that the body be fully engaged for achieving the ultimate goal of life, swarta gatim. And I just thought of a few practical ways in which one can utilize one's body. There are practical ways in which to stay close to the practice of bhakti. And one of them that I've found is by having a uh, what is called an automatic watering system. In my garden at home, in our backyard, in Burlingame, California, and in the front yard, we have, and in the side yard, we have <laughs> automatic watering system. Because we're not there for the plants as much as we'd like to. We think about them a lot, but we're not there. And it's said that the best fertilizer is a gardener's shadow. However, th there is a way in which one can set up an automatic watering system. And they're very sophisticated. It takes um, some design. You have to lay down some um, hoses that go throughout the garden and permeate the garden in the place where the plants are going to be so that it's aiming at the roots. Then there's uh, an el electronic system through which you can designate how much water goes to each section of your garden on a regular basis. And that will happen and does happen even when you're not home. The, the water systems uh, open up and the plants get watered naturally. And so I've always thought of uh, ways in which our lives are like that. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gave this metaphor of a gardener for devotees are gardeners. And we should water the bhakti lata, or the seed of bhakti, especially by hearing and chanting. And so it's, it's very beneficial to be 
properly situated in bhakti to, or, to organize one's own uh, regular system of hearing and chanting, wherever one might be. And one of the ways is to uh, pick uh, a certain amount of reading or hearing and chanting that one might do every day. I um, carry this book with me. In fact, since we've come from the airport a few days ago, and to the, the interim times we've had riding in Ubers and things like that around the city, I've finished quite a bit of this Bhagavatam. And um, Govinda was there most of the time. He'll notice that you know, our time in the car or you know, standing on an elevator, whatever it, it might be, the book comes out and, and it's available and you can read. One of the ways that I find reading in a regulated way to be very inspiring is um, I have a little marker in this book, well, more than one, but there's one that's especially important here. And that is this little marker. Can you see that? It has a number on it. Can someone verify what this number is? 41. 41. Now, the reason that says 41 is when I start off my day, I, I move it 41 pages forward, mm -hmm. and it sticks in the book. You can buy these at Office Depot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you can write on it with a Sharpie, whatever number you pick. And then, when you start your day, and it's an amazing way in which to uh, bring your mind into the fold of, of the practice. But you might, you know, if you finish eight, you could put an eight on there and then move it forward. And the, what that would mean would be, that if you would finish your eight pages a day, you would finish the whole Bhagavatam in five years. And we just uh, met uh, a devotee recently. Last week, he came up to me and said, you know, five years ago, you told me about this. And he said, you said to me that you're going to be five years older in five years anyway. But if you read eight pages a day, you will have finished the Bhagavatam. And he said, well, now I'm five years older and I've finished the Bhagavatam. Oh. And, so, <laughs> and there's a difference between someone who's five years older and who's read the Bhagavatam and someone who's five years older and hasn't read the Bhagavatam. You'll notice the difference. And... If you put a 41, if you dare to put a 41 on that sticker, <laughs> automatic watering system, then you'll finish the whole Bhagavatam in one year. That means all 12 cantos to the very end. You pick any number, it really doesn't matter. Prabhupada mentions that if you just do one verse a day, you'll finish in 50 years. <laughs> and he said, that's very nice. Whatever pace you're on, if you make it an automatic watering system to make sure that you're making progress so that if somebody wakes you up at one in the morning and says, when are you going to finish the Bhagavatam, you'll be able to tell them the date. <laughs> you can actually do that now. There's an app online. It's called Be a Sage Page by Page. It's a free app you can download to your phone and you can pick any of Prabhupada's books and you can dial in the period of time you'd like to finish any of the books and it'll tell you how many pages that you need to read every day. And then all you need to do is stop at Office Depot and get yourself a little pack of stickers and a Sharpie and write the number and you'll be surprised how inspired you'll feel when you have a goal to go for when you continue reading. Another uh, way in which you can always stay present in your practice is this really old-fashioned thing called index cards. And a friend of mine introduced me to this many, many years ago, uh, pre-computer and, um, you know, uh, when that's, that's all we had. But I reread it in a book recently, and, and it served me well throughout the years, having, keeping on index cards various things that I've read or, or verses and things, because you can pull them out at any time. These are when you want to use up like one minute. Let's just say someone says, I'll be right back. <laughs> and what does that usually mean? <laughs> it's like you have no idea when they're coming. Oh, I'm really sorry, you know, my car got towed. And then next thing you know, you know, you've got five minutes, ten minutes, a half hour. But if you have, if you're ready in your pocket, two seconds away from keeping the vibration going, then you'll always be in the vibration. And what is the harm in that? Is there any harm in that, in staying close to the vibration? The atmosphere of the world is such that if you try to stay in the vibration for 
if, if you're in materialistic association, people look at, at you askance, like, come on, give us a break. Do you always have to be hearing and chanting? <laughs> but if you're in the association of serious devotees, they'll look at you for about two seconds and think, oh, come on, and they'll go, yeah, you're right, we yeah. should do this. <laughs> and keep going, and then you'll feel like you're in the flow and you're happy. So index cards are very powerful, and I, I just, uh, I got reconfirmation of this. I was reading a book about writing recently. It's called Bird by Bird. It's an excellent book on writing. And, and in the book, she talks, does the author Natalie Goldberg, right? Yeah. She talks about how she uses index cards and she said a writer is always aware of his or her environment and trying to take from it all the time, whatever happens. So she said she's always got index cards and she writes down everything and then keeps it. So in a similar way, one can keep these uh, fantastically useful tools with one and ha always have a pen and mark down the kinds of things you hear from others that are meaningful to you because don't trust your intelligence and think that, you know, I'll get it back later. It won't come back. It'll fly off to never, never land and never come back. And if you write it down, then you'll have it forever. So this, this is, these are a couple of the ways that you can stay in the vibration. Now let's hear any of the reflections that you gleaned from your neighbor, your friendly neighbor. <laughs> we'll take four samplings. What did, the, what did the person next to you say was the key thing they were taking away? But you've got to be quick because we're running out of time. Yes? Uh, Minna was sharing that she was appreciating the fact that when you said, when, um, when it was brought up that uh, being attached to the material world isn't natural. And, and when you said, about, uh, wake up, little Jiva, you don't belong here. She was saying that she really appreciated that that's, it isn't our natural condition to be so embedded in this world that I should have meant for something else. Yeah, it's a relief, isn't it? Because it's like you have a bad dream. And, you, and then you wake up and you think, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. Yeah, nice. Thank you very much. Who else would like to share what the, a friend told them? I don't know what name of my lady. So she was sharing that. Like, well, you got to uh, say her name. I she mentioned that like she understood the importance of Krishna consciousness and urgency and she really said that we should not waste our time and take it, that's what it means. I'm reframing, I'm using different words, but that word, that's what it means. So I really liked it, that thing, how she appreciated it and she showed that urgency that uh, I should take to Krishna, I mean, full advantage of this uh, Krishna conscious moment and this is gone and go back home back to the Okay, don't waste time. Was that it? The essence? That's a, that's a um, important goal to work towards. Thank you. Two more. Yes. So, the Dini Shakti Guru was mentioning that, it is a, that we're required to be reflective and through observation um, deeply contemplate that we're on the body. Yes. It's encouraging that, that anyone can do this. We're fully equipped as human beings to introspect and to get something out of it. And if we take guidance from the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Bhagavad Gita as we introspect, we could actually uh, be properly aligned. And Krishna mentions this in the Bhagavad Gita in the 15th chapter when he talks about the ways that people leave the world. He says, Ukramantam stitam vapi bunjanam vagunam vitam vimudanam pashanti pashanti gana chakshusa yatanto yoginas chainam pashantyatman yavastitam yatanto prakritatmano nainam pashantya chaitasaha. So here he's describing the way in which uh, the most confounding situation of our entire lives, the most radical thing you can actually do in this world is leave your body. It freaks everybody out, totally. You just, ukramantam means you step out of your body. Ukramantam, I mean, just the first word that he used, ukramantam, he's like, where is he? He just stepped out. <laughs> That's what devotees are seeing. Ukramantam stitam vapi, he was situated in the body, now he stepped out. Ukramantam stitam vapi, bunjanam vagunam vitam. But if somebody's vumuda, they're really ignorant, they're stupid. 
because they didn't study the science. They didn't understand from authority what's actually happening. They can't understand anything. And Krishna goes on to say, if somebody's eyes are trained in knowledge, they can see what's happening. What's valuable? That or going to, you know, paying like $200,000 in tuition to learn how to, you know, glue stuff together. <laughs> Whether it's stem cells or anything else. I mean, nothing against science. I'll take the stem cell when I need it. But the fact is, the most important thing that, that we, you can learn is like what happens? What's the mechanism? Why am I stepping out of my body? How do I step into a new body? Everyone should know that. One last uh, reflection that you heard from your, your neighbor. Yeah. Krishna, Daniel Kuru was saying like two points, two one was about the same consciousness, but it's really Hold that a little closer. Uh, Daniel was saying the same thing about the consciousness, whether it's exists in the material uh, situation, or the same consciousness can be shifted in which the spiritual uh, practices. And the other thing was about how the lawyer telling the teacher to actually Yeah. You got to lawyer up. <laughs> lawyer up here. Just as soon as you're born, you should lawyer up. Like, I don't know how I got into this, but <laughs> I need a good lawyer now. <laughs> don't go it alone. Yeah, and the consciousness, it's, it's really a matter of wherever we invest it, it's going to have a consequence. Consciousness is consequential. I mean, look at, look at somebody right now and see what happens. Just take a look. You don't even want to do it, right? Because it's so consequential. Just look at somebody and see what happens. You're going like, nah, I'm not going to do it. Because wh wherever you look, there's a consequence. Like if you're driving down the freeway and you're the passenger in the car, and you look at the, per the person driving next to you, just look at them, see what happens. They go, what? You know, like they'll start trying to like run you off the road because like, why were you looking at me? You know, because there's consequence. We're con we are consequential because we're part and parcel of Krishna. And wherever you look, wherever you invest that consciousness, it's going to bloom. Something's going to happen. So the science of Krishna consciousness is so commonsensical that if you just put your consciousness in the place where you get the, the, the naturally um, important result, which is reconnection to your original divine source, Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it just makes perfect sense. And like, why wouldn't you do it? And he's all attractive anyways, so he's not very hard on the eyes. You can just sit there and look at him. I have a picture of Krishna in my room. He's a baby, and he's, he's you know, eating butter out of a pot. But I just got intrigued with the stuff he's wearing. He's a little baby, but he's got, like, these, like, talismans and all kinds of necklaces on. And I'm thinking, he's cool. That's the coolest baby I've ever seen in my life. You know, and if you just, like, examine Krishna and start looking, like, all his lifestyle... And the way he wears things, and the way he walks around, and the stuff he says to his friends, it, it's kind of, that's what everyone's actually looking for. But they're not getting it here in this world. So if you just transfer your interest into the, you know, into Krishna Kata, into the Bhagavatam, this is the transfer of your attention, and it has the biggest consequence of all. And that's just the basic, simple process of Krishna consciousness that is universal, non-sectarian, and appealing to practically anyone who hears it in a very basic way. And now we have two minutes left, right? Yes. yes. So see if you have a two-minute question, because we didn't take any questions. I'll see if I have a one-minute and 30-second answer. <laughs> <laughs> questions are hard, but for my contention is with any good hearing and chanting session, you should come out with more questions than answers. Because when you have questions, it means you've widened your surface area. You've increased your surface area, so now you can take in more. So hearing and chanting, it's not that you can come to a conclusion and you know everything. It's now you know more that you don't know, and you become hungry for it. So what, now what do you know that you don't know that you're hungry for? <laughs> yes, Prabhu. Uh, Prabhupada was going to the Prabhupada gave this uh, shloka in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, those who are faithful on the path will again have to take part in the Shiva world. So this refers to someone who's already on the path but not faithful to it. So what does that mean, not faithful to the path? 
Pashradhana Purusha Dharma Syasya Parantapa A Prapyamam Nivartante Mrityu Samsaravartvini. I can't remember the exact purport. Do you know what Prabhupada says in the purport to that verse? Uh, just uh, open to that really quick. Nine. What is that? Nine? Nine. Nine. Prabhupada starts with this the faithfulness cannot accomplish this process of devotional service. That is the purport of this verse. Faith is created by association with devotees. Well, there's a way in which. Uh, faith has to be purified. And in the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says a person is made of his or her faith. Faith is actually substantial. It's not wispy or amorphous, as some, some people think. Oh, it's just faith. But actually, that is the real substance. As you can discern from, from even this world, we can't move without faith. Unless we have trust in something, like somebody hands you something to eat. If it's a stranger... You might just put it in your bag and throw it away later because you, know, you don't know what's in it. But if it's your mom, you know, considering that she's a devotee, you know, it's like you just eat it because, oh, it's for my mom, I trust. So we only move in the world because of faith. So there's a, there's a thickening of faith and a purification of faith that takes place by association with those who are already faithful. Krishna... Um, uh, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur describes the advancement of devotional, as, uh, devotional service as a thickening of faith. Adau Shraddha, Tata Sarasanga, Tabhajana Kriya, Tato Narta, Nivriti, Sattato Nishta, Ruchi Sattata, etc. And also in the Sri Brahma Samhita, Yadrishi Yadrishi Shraddha Siddhir Bhavati Tadrishi. As you increase your faith, you become more and more perfect. And so, really, the process of Krishna consciousness has to do with faith. So, what does it mean? Shraddha. Da is an active verb. It means where you're placing something. And shrad means the heart. So, what are you putting your heart into? Oftentimes, people will understanding something, understand something intellectually, perhaps philosophically, but they don't put their heart into it because they haven't developed uh, that actual faith in, in the object itself, in the, in the goal. So... If we're on the path of Krishna consciousness, we're advised to avoid bad association, those kinds of uh, people who might dissuade us from developing our faith, and we should associate with those who will help us increase. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai, Gaur Bhakti Vrindi Ki Jai, Bhagavad Shravana Ki Jai, Bhakti Center Ki Jai, Shri Shri Radha Murli Dai Ki Jai, Shri Gauranga Mahaprabhu Ki Jai, Shri Shri Lakshmi Nishingadev Ki Jai, Gaur Premanandi Hari Jai. Not to the arm, Marman. Not to the arm, Marman. Hey, not to the arm, Marman. Not to the arm, Marman. Not to the arm, Marman. Not to the arm, Marman.